Oh, hey everyone, one quick second. I'm just gonna destroy an enemy platoon real quick. No, not with this, but with this. You see, drone warfare is here to stay. And I've crashed a $50 million drone. As of 2015, the Air Force is training more drone pilots than actual aircraft pilots. And when you look at the 2020 nagorno karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's an indication of how important the future of UAV warfare will be. Because the Turkish-backed Azerbaijan forces were able to win the conflict swiftly thanks to their use of drones. It was so decisive that the claim going around out there in all the articles is that UAVs are gonna make tanks obsolete going forward. Reports from the front lines though are showing us that insurgents are getting far too creative with this warfare fad. For instance, they're dropping munitions from drones onto the top of the weakly armored tops of M1 Abrams tanks. This next generation of UAVs are essentially the cheap bargain bin version of top attack javelin systems. You would think it wouldn't be such a surprise with these things being sold since 2007 at every Long Island mall kiosk. The Warzone reported that the US is developing a five kilowatt mobile high energy laser gun, which can shoot down UAVs from miles away. It also has an electronics warfare equipment that can jam UAV signals and crash them. They took out dozens of drones when they were testing this equipment. At the end of the video, we'll also get a little bit into the ethics of drone warfare. But is China and Russia's drone technology outclassing the United States? Or is that just aliens flying circles around F-15s in the Pacific? Either way, quite frankly, it's terrifying. So how did drones evolve from my uncle's weekend hobby of flying remote controlled airplanes from Radio Shack to where it is today? What tactics do military UAVs use and how are they already starting to affect modern conflicts? Justin Taylor, the lieutenant I always wish I had, is gonna give the rundown on the origins of drone warfare. Make sure to show him some support by sending an unmanned Hellfire missile into that like button. Can I say that? Was that in poor taste? I'm going to explain to you a good little bit about the history of drone warfare. Before even the first aircraft took off, humans were experimenting with unmanned aerial drones as a form of warfare. From balloons strapped with bombs against Vienna in 1850 to the V-1 rocket launched against London in 1942, the idea of letting a machine do all the dirty work for us has always fascinated humans. The first example of modern day drone use happened all the way back in Vietnam. In the late 1950s, early 1960s, there was a large operational and capabilities gap between spy satellites and spy planes and lower echelon ground-based reconnaissance. The solution to this was the Ryan 147B drone. The Pentagon expressed a need for this kind of unmanned aerial craft after a series of fatalities involving spy plane pilots. They needed a way to collect ground information without putting the lives of spy plane pilots at risk, which were hard to train and expensive to equip. The 147B was the first unmanned aerial craft capable of flying over enemy airspace, collecting ground information with its onboard sensors and cameras, and then returning back over front lines. While collecting information, it also served as a decoy for enemy AA positions, dropped munitions on fixed targets, and would spread airborne leaflets for propaganda and psychological operation purposes. I always wanted to drop condescending pamphlets on op-4 positions, but my commander would never let me. The Ryan Bottle 147B, also known as the Lightning Bug, was produced by Ryan Aeronautical and adapted from their series of Firebee target drones that were used, as the name implies, as target practice for anti-aircraft crews. Developed in the late 1950s, it was first introduced in 1962 during the Vietnam War and stayed in service for a full decade. The drones were launched either by being strapped to the wing of a KC-130 aircraft and launched like an oversized missile or fired from the ground using a solid rocket booster. After flying for a pre-designated amount of time, the the drone would then deploy a parachute and the whole aircraft would be collected via a helicopter while still in mid-air. Not the job I would want if I were a crew chief. After the Vietnam War, however, American interest in drone technology quickly fell off due to the increases of satellite spy capabilities and the advancement of ground-based information gathering. The drones were seen as expensive and unreliable toys, which were then quickly put by the wayside. This dramatically changed, however, in 1982. During the Lebanese Civil War, the Israeli Air Force went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Syrians. Codenamed Operation Mole Cricket 19, it was a deliberate suppression of Syrian air defense systems launched by the IAF and was the largest air battle since World War II. Critical to the Israeli strategy was the use of unmanned aerial vehicles. The Israelis used a similar engineered drone as the ones used by the United States in Vietnam, the IAI Scout Drone. 
These proved to be an overwhelming advantage against the Syrian Air Force. They served as electronic decoys, communication jammers, as well as provided real-time video surveillance, which at the time was absolutely revolutionary. Due to the support from the UAVs, Israel was able to destroy 28 SAM sites and over 80 enemy aircraft while suffering minimal losses of their own. This dramatically changed the world's view and opinion on drone technologies and capabilities and immediately caught the attention of American naval brass. And just two years later, in 1984, America had its own drone research program in full swing. Cappy's favorite government agency, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, issued a $40 million contract to the leading systems incorporated company out of Irvine, California. Their goal was to create a drone capable of high loitering time or time spent in and around a target that could be used for photographic reconnaissance, ELINT missions, or just filled with explosives and used as a cruise missile. The drone was nicknamed Amber. It was 15 feet long with a 30-foot wingspan, weighed 740 pounds, most of that weight coming from its construction of plastic and Kevlar, and most impressively, could stay in the air for over 38 hours without having to come down for refueling. In classic DoD fashion, however, Amber was only one of several drone research projects. When Congress found out about the multiple projects going on at once, they quickly lamented the duplication of efforts and drastically cut drone spending across the board. Amber was the sole survivor of this drastic cut in funds, it would continue operational research up until early 1990, at which time funding would be cut even more, bankrupting SLI completely. They would then be bought out by General Atomics, which would take the AMBER program and develop into something that you and I might recognize today, but more on that later. Drone warfare, ironically enough, we get a huge kick in popularity soon after during the first Gulf War. The DoD utilized two types of drones, the Pointer and the more sophisticated Pioneer drone, which was a final development of the drones used by the Israelis mentioned earlier. A fun fact, the Pioneer ran off of a 26 horsepower snowmobile engine with a range of 100 miles, a flight time of five hours, and carried a number of advanced sensors, such as forward looking infrared and day TV. Uh, another fun fact is that there is a Pioneer drone right in front of my brigade commander's office. Uh, however, uh, as a rule, I avoid full birds, so this is the only picture I'm willing to provide. It was launched via catapult and controlled with a glorified RC plane remote control. I'm more of a trebuchet man myself, but they did not consult me before going with the catapult. During the Gulf War, naval reports said that at any given moment, there was always at least one drone up in the air. And by the end of the conflict, there had been a total of 522 sorties done during Desert Storm. These uses ranged from spotting and feeding targeting data for battleship guns to scanning for probing attacks along the Kuwaiti border. During the last week of the war, history experienced one of its strangest surrenders when five Iraqi soldiers waved white flags at the drone that was surveying them and was reported as the first time ever that man had surrendered to robot. My conspiracy theory friends tell me that it will not be the last. The drones were so effective in their role that no longer would there be any question of their effectiveness and their role in U.S. doctrine. The new millennia brought about a new renaissance of drone capabilities. Seeing the return of General Atomic's drone program, they provided the U.S. Air Force with 60 RQ-1 UAVs, dubbed the Predator. After a series of operational and testing improvements, it saw its first substantial use in Afghanistan in 2000. In a joint CIA-DOD mission to eliminate Osama bin Laden, a Predator was launched into Afghanistan from Europe, but was controlled entirely by pilots via satellite from the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, a feat which had never been accomplished before. The Predator served both as a reconnaissance element and the launching platform for a Hellfire air-to-ground missile. While the mission was ultimately a failure in eliminating the bin bad guy Laden, it proved the capabilities of the drone and would set the stage for drone warfare in the 21st century. In the first decade of the 2000s, the Predator and its soon-to-be little brother, the Reaper, would be the standard reconnaissance and airstrike platforms for drone use. And they both saw extensive service starting in Afghanistan in 2001 and the invasion of Iraq in 2003. From 2003 to 2006, the U.S. Air Force participated in over 242 individual raids, engaged 132 troops in force protection operations, fired 59 Hellfire missiles, surveyed 18,490 targets, escorted four convoys, and flew 2,073 sorties for a combined 33,833 flying hours. Which, for those of you less mathematically inclined like me is almost six separate sorties every single day a huge leap from one drone in the air at a time during the gulf war okay so the way i look at it is from 2010 to 2020 it's been kind of a period of refinement for our friends the drones they were upgraded with countermeasures like additional hellfire missiles so they're carrying eight instead of two in their payload now 
and we gave them increased electronic warfare abilities. They were given the ability to launch from C-17s in Afghanistan while being controlled by Jeff at the CIA on Long Island. Once the military finds a platform that they like, they start upgrading the thing to death. And why not? It's a brilliant approach. Instead of reinventing the wheel every time, give it a software upgrade and save millions of dollars that way. In the past few years, insurgents have become prolific users of modded out drones. Reports of the same happening in Ukraine, civil war, shows how effective all military forces are finding these drones to be for increasing situational awareness. Fighter jets need to refuel every couple of hours. Meanwhile, drones can loiter over the battlefield for over 24 hours. When I was in Iraq, I can't tell you how many missions were started off with someone shaking me awake and saying, hey, Cappy, wake up. We're going on patrol. A drone spotted some suspicious movement nearby. It looks like the enemy's planting IEDs again. But now, 10 years later, it's expected to become a part of the infantry's job description as well. I like how they keep adding responsibilities to your job without increasing your pay. That's not frustrating at all, I'm sure. Each squad will now have a mini UAV organic to them, which will be useful for scouting ahead on patrols and searching for potential ambushes along the way. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the controversy surrounding this type of warfare. Internationally, there is widespread disapproval of this type of weapon. Interestingly enough, it's more of a high approval rating within the United States. The planes drop munitions from 30,000 feet high and artillery can launch explosives miles away, but that doesn't bother people as much as the thought of UAVs though. I think the reason people are more bothered by this form of warfare is because of what it means for our future. When the consequences of personal injury is removed from the equation of war, then the potential for unnecessary destruction goes up, or at least that's likely what some people's perception is. People want the military to have some skin in the game during the battles they fight. Another part of it is it removes that human element from the decision-making process to destroy something. You're one step removed from it. The responsibility is no longer completely on you, so the argument here is that people are more likely to pull the trigger when it's not it's them sending a signal to a satellite, sending a signal to a drone. It removes some of that, that culpability. Is that the right word? There are also those who feel UAVs are leading us down a road to autonomous kill bots that will one day go full Skynet on us and wipe out all of humanity. And then the other popular argument against drones is that drone warfare is a useful tool for insurgent recruitment. Although that is disputed by a 2018 MIT paper by Aquil Shaha, titled, Do U.S. Drone Strikes Cause Blowback? In the paper, they claim of the 500 insurgents that were surveyed in a Pakistani jail, drone strikes do not account for the main reason or main motivation for why they joined the insurgent groups. In 2020, drone warfare graduated into the big leagues of modern large-scale conflicts. Colonel Scott Shaw, the head of the Army's asymmetrical warfare group, had this to say about that, quote, What's clear in the conflict is that a less funded nation can do combined arms warfare. You don't need to be the United States or Russia. The price point to entry into combined arms warfare is lower than initially thought." End quote. We had never seen them used at this scale before and the results were unbelievable. Drones were widely used by one side during the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war. The Turkish-backed Arajaban used them to identify targets, send artillery GPS coordinates for quick fire missions. Azerbaijan used UAV strikes to take out 13 enemy surface-to-air missile systems. They destroyed Armenian tanks with such ease that there are all kinds of articles coming out now about how tanks are obsolete on the modern battlefield. This shows drones are even more effective during conventional wars than the asymmetrical wars like in the Middle East during the past two conflicts. These unmanned weapons will remain an important tool, but they are far from taking the lead yet. I want to know what your thoughts are on UAVs though. Do you think that they're just a fad or are they one day going to be our robot overlords? I'm Chris Cappy from Task and Purpose. Please remember to like this video so YouTube will promote our content to a larger audience and subscribe so that I can see you here next week.